first birthday on which he is not present. We lost him last July. And in the last phase of his life and artistic career, Raza has been painting ceaselessly. He lived to paint and painted to live. There was no other work. He had used to use a phrase called Swadharm, which he picked up from Gandhiji and Vinoba Bhave. And he said, each one should act according to Swadharm. And my dharm is to paint. I request Reena Lart, the publisher and the Madonna behind all this, <laughs> to present a copy. So should we first unveil the copy? Yes, yes. start with Ranjit Hoskote, yeah, because you're nearest. Simple reason. Oh, okay. Oh, there. Am I back up? Do you want us to come up there? Whichever way you like. You can speak to me. Okay. Well, I was hoping to go on last, settling down to listen to other people, but there we are. Rather painted the uh, Heram, uh, the last day of Gandhi, first. Okay. I thought, uh, <laughs> I'm, however, not yet assassinated. <laughs> so, uh, Your Excellency, friends and colleagues, um, it actually is uh, both a festive and a solemn occasion. Not least because um, we're surrounded in a very physical sense by the afterlife of a painter who is so important to us personally as a historical figure for his contribution to post-colonial Indian art. And uh, Ashokji and Krishna have both spoken eloquently and wonderfully about what his presence meant. So what I'm going to try and do really is to just um, offer five brief remarks, which are really in the nature of fragmentary responses to these works, to the life from which they emerge and the contexts to which they speak. Uh, I just want to, I'll begin really by thinking about the icon as a very particular kind of image because the challenge of responding to Gandhi is one that many Indian artists have taken up uh, repeatedly. Uh, from my own uh, intimate experience, I would think of my friend Atul Dodia's work, uh, the series called uh, An Artist of Nonviolence, which was shown in Delhi, as a matter of fact, in 1999. And that is not an isolated example. Is this reverberating? Can you hear me? Yeah, it's yeah, okay. So there is this extraordinary presence, this physical the physicality of this historical figure, commemorated through, we have to say, the mass media. It's really through the photographs that we know and, and cherish the Mahatma. So we are responding not only to his life, but also to a particular kind of photography and a moment in the history of documentation. But what you see here, what we see here, is a sort of, if you will, rejection or a declining of the icon. And I find that a very interesting gesture. So it, in a way, it allows us to sidestep the entire polarization that we have between idolatry on the one hand and iconoclasm on the other. And in many ways, whether it's as a society here in India or across the world, this is one of the key debates around the image that we are all caught up in, in one way or another. There's either, it's an either or, and like all either ors, it's a dangerous thing. So what 
Raza seems to have done here is to somehow move away from this mechanism, this process by which you first venerate a focal image, it becomes an icon, you invest it with value, but valorization gives way to naturalization and experience, which eventually becomes a kind of invisibility. It's in plain sight. The Mahatma is everywhere. He's on our currency notes still. Uh, this may not prevail a year from now, but nonetheless. But he is ubiquitous and forgotten. Uh, and there's a kind of amnesia in plain sight that attends this kind of process. Uh, and then, of course, sometimes the valorization, the amnesia are all replaced by a brutal erasure. That entire process, which we've seen take place in other contexts, is somehow avoided in these works. So that's, as it were, the first move that I want to draw attention to. I'm sure it's, uh, it's occurred to most of you already, but I thought we'd put this uh, down so we're all on the same page. As a second move, I find what happens here is that Raza draws attention to a very particular kind of drama that has always been part of the story of abstraction. I mean, we typically think of abstraction as abstraction versus something or the other. We always cast abstraction in an oppositional kind of way. And usually it's against the object, against the figure. But something that we don't always address is the way in which abstraction tends to oppose language. Because the abstract gesture is something that resists interpretation. It resists the words you apply to art. And what seems to happen in these works is that Raza pulls that particular discussion out and foregrounds it. So it's very much the abstract painterly gesture that resists interpretation, which shares space and is in interplay with the word, with language, with very fraught words. So that's the other uh, point that I'd make here, the, the lifelong wrestle with language. And it's not just then, my third point now is that it's not any old language, it's not any old words, it's a citational gesture. And it's a citation which is an example of what I'd like to think of as anamnesia. It's the gesture of deliberately not forgetting, it's the gesture of resisting amnesia. And it takes the form, therefore, of bringing back to mind and into play uh, fragments from spiritual legacies that were very central to the Mahatma's work. You know, we've talked often, of course, of Narsi Mehta's presence in Gandhi's work, and it is there through the, the extract from the Bhajan, Vaishnava Janatu, Teneka Ye. But I'm equally, if not more, interested in Ishwar Allah Teronam. Because that reminds us, I mean, we take this as part and parcel of a certain kind of secular legacy, but it might be worth our while to pinpoint where it actually comes from. It comes from the heritage of the Pranami school. Uh, and the Mahatma's mother was a votary of this, of this spiritual lineage, as we know. And it goes back to Mahamati Prana, who was a syncretic figure, in whose work what we now call Hinduism and Islam were actually confluential. And, uh, and form a third thing. So when we use this, when we read in Raza's painting and recite to ourselves these words, we're actually reactivating another and very, very different moment in our own history. We are opening up capacious horizons of spiritual experience, which invite us to look beyond what we've committed ourselves to now, these hard-edged, identitarian, political forms of religiosity, which we think are somehow religion. And in that sense, we're being asked to look beyond the kind of swir and para that we've created for ourselves today. And again, this is something which in their modest, low-key way, I think these paintings actually do. They invite us to look at prior forms of spiritual experience that are more expansive than what we've given ourselves in the age of so-called modernity. And I'm reminded here of uh, a little exchange from uh, Ramana Maharishi. Uh, on the rare occasions when the great man actually spoke or put things down on his slate. Uh, a questioner asked him, how should we treat others? And the answer on the slate came back, there are no others. You know, so this is something that we might think about when we try and define ourselves antagonistically against others. Uh, briefly also, these paintings, I think, invite us to think about landscape and what landscape might mean. And this, again, this is completely idiosyncratic. You will probably all disagree. But uh, in the painting with which I began my parikrama of, of this exhibition, Satya, 
There was an element in it which just for no good reason, remind, for actually very good reason, reminded me of, um, of Diebenkorn's Ocean Park series. There's something in these works which puts you in mind of that kind of expansiveness and understanding of what the infinite might mean. And that set me thinking also of how somebody like Raza, nomadic as he was, nonetheless needed to craft for himself some notion of belonging that was anchored. But I'd like to think that it was not an anchorage in an actual primordially given place. It was a belonging that was crafted out of memory, out of desire, out of a certain kind of aspiration. And it takes us back to words like vatan, which of course Ashokji referred to, but also words like zameen. And zameen again, I'm thinking here of Hussein's great painting, which is at the NGMA here. These are words that defy, or bhumi, which sometimes gets taken over by the wrong kind of thinker. Uh, these are words that also resist interpretation. They resist our desire to locate them in, a, in the particularity of place. They have a kind of meaning that becomes part of your nomadic baggage and part of how you structure your own consciousness. So those notions of an earth that is not necessarily material earth is, I think that inhabits these works as well. And at the end, I'm going to, I'll close with uh, a disquiet, actually. There's a way in which we can look at these paintings as a glossary. They're a collection of extracts, they are Mahavakyas, they're things that mean much. But one of those terms in this glossary troubled me, and it's troubled me for a long time. And that word is, in fact, Swadharma. Because there are really two ways of approaching the question of Swadharma. One is the classical, where it actually appears, it comes from the Bhagavad Gita. But in the Bhagavad Gita, as we all know, it is embedded within the context of caste society. Swadharma Nidhanam Shreya Paradharma Bhayava, it says very clearly. It's much better to die doing your own duty well rather than to try and do somebody else's. But can we move this understanding of what the Swadharma and what that Swar is, can we move it away from this very hard-edged caste society? And can we get to a point where that Swar itself can be crafted, not as a primordial self, but as a self that is somehow made through agency and not through structure. But my expression of that disquiet is not a criticism of, of the works at all. It's actually, in a sense, it speaks to the way in which these paintings from Raza's afterlife uh, remain alive and animated, and they're very much part of a national or a social discussion that we should all be part of, if you will, this larger conversation. Thank you for your attention. Friends, uh, I feel doubly handicapped as I stand before you and speak uh, first because whatever I should have said about my interest um, in literature, in art, in music, these are all interests of a dilettante. And to be standing here in the presence of three experts and to be talking about these paintings is indeed a big challenge and I don't think I'm equal to that challenge. The other handicap is that I have seen these seven paintings just now and Ashok already has mentioned that. Now, how do I look at these seven paintings, especially uh, when I'm told that this is a series of paintings, this is a set of paintings about Gandhi? Now, let us assume for a moment that we are not told that these are paintings about Gandhi. I enter the hall, I start seeing these paintings, 
Will I necessarily respond to these paintings as paintings about Kanti? The answer is most probably not. It will take me a while to realize this presence, the presence of the great old man. Now, when that will happen, I really don't know. But now, of course, the invitation we first sent made it clear that this is a set of paintings about Gandhi. So I'm not saying that I was told, I, I was told just now, I have known it all along. But once I know that these are seven paintings about Gandhi, how do I respond to them? I have been interested would be a wrong word to say. I can't say I've been interested in Gandhi. I've been engaging with Gandhi as a historian and as a human being for quite some time. And I'm not saying this as a self-advertisement, but at a certain point in time, Gandhi literally forced me to write a small book, which had to be in Hindi, which is my mother tongue. Until then, all my books had been in English. So it had to be in English, in Hindi, this small book on Gandhi. And uh, I called it, or the book called itself, Gandhi, Ek Asambhav Sambhavna. So that is how I see Gandhi, Ek Asambhav Sambhavna, an impossible possibility, a possibility which for all, which at least ostensibly looks impossible. But since we have seen, historically we have seen that the, this possibility materialized, so to that extent it is not quite impossible. And while writing that book, I was struck by a, a phrase which Gandhi used in a letter to Jawaharlal Nehru, and the phrase is, Asli Baat. Now I'm saying Asli Baat because this is a letter in Hindustani. It is very difficult to translate Asli Baat. How do I say Asli Baat? The real thing, the essence, thingness, as Gopal Gandhi says in his essay in this book. Now Gandhi, howsoever we understand it, Gandhi is primarily interested in Asli Baat. And what is Raza interested in? Raza is interested in Asli Baat. Beyond all appearances, beyond all ruses, not how things appear on the surface, but how things really are. We never know how things really are, what the real nature of things is, what is their essence, but we try. And Raza, all his life, is, is struggling with that. And that is the essence of abstraction. So Gandhi is primarily interested in abstraction. We can call it distillation, asli baad, and Raza, once I know that these paintings are either about Gandhi or inspired by Gandhi, I can see that Raza is trying to see that Asli Baat. And the first painting, which Ashok now tells us is the first in the series, He Ram. Now, how do I look at this painting, Hera? We all know, or one can even say 
we have been told as a historian, if I were a stickler for accuracy, I would say, we have been told that Gandhi's last words were Hela. Skeptics have questioned it. And there will never be any decisive evidence whether Gandhi did say or did not say Hela as he faced his end. But if we have understood any, anything of Gandhi, the asli of Gandhi, it is not just likely, it is certain that he would have said Hera. But this Hera, which Raza paints, I see this as a departure in Raza's painting. No Bindu, no Chakra. The colors are very different. There's a kind of quiet there and also a turmoil. In this quiet and this turmoil, how does one make sense of this? And if I have understood Gandhi, then this one painting by Raza, Heiram, and the colors which he had used, and, and the kind of shapes which you see there, this quiet and also the turmoil. And that, to my mind, represents the real essence of Gandhi. We have we often think of him as Mahatma. We think of him as a realized soul, one he was at, who was at peace with himself. I know a very different Gandhi. I know a Gandhi who was all his life at war with himself. There's a book you may have read Gandhi's war with India. One could also talk of Gandhi's war with humanity. But Gandhi's real war is with himself. The man is never at peace. And towards the end, in one of his public statements, I think this was a prayer discourse, he said, and permit me to say this in Hindustani, I am almost quoting on these words from memory. Bachpan se meri zindagi mein ladai badhi hai. Ab mein chahta hoon ki mujhe aur ladai na ladni pade. And what happens? Ladai ladni pade rahi hai. Calcutta fastened to death, Delhi fastened to death. A proposed meeting in Vardha, where future program would be decided as to what would really happen to this country if this is the kind of policies the government is going to follow. Can we possibly have an alternative to what this government is trying to do. But before that meeting could materialize, Gandhi was assassinated. So this turmoil in Gandhi, which often remains invisible to us, either because we don't really care to know more about Gandhi, or Perhaps because it will make us uncomfortable, it will put, we will we, we'll see ourselves in Gandhi's mirror that this is what we did to the old man. We made life miserable for him. So it is this Gandhi who seems to appear before me as I see Raza's era. Now, 
I would have very much wanted to go on to other paintings also, especially the black in Shanti, but I know I have already taken my, my 10 minutes. So finally I would like to talk about, well, just briefly mention something. These seven paintings, they fall in two obvious categories, sharply defined, no, or different categories. Five of one kind and two here. Now this man who is transcreating here, who is not transliterating, who is not even translating, he is transcreating, suddenly does something literal. He quotes. What is the compulsion behind Raza's finally deciding he would not paint? Paint in the normal sense of the word. This is a painting also, but he would say, no, I will not paint. I just cannot paint. This has to be in Gandhi's words. That has to be in Vinoba's words. And I think there are reasons for us to reflect over this contrast. Thank you very much. So I'm going to give my vote of thanks now. His Excellency, though he's not here anymore, Krishan ji, Ashok ji, Ashudra ji, Udayan ji, Sudhir ji, and Ranjit bhai. Before I embark on my vote of thanks, I would like to take this opportunity share a few words with you. In 2010, I met Raza Saab at a Kolkata home and I remember when I asked him what advice he had to give to the younger generation, this is what he had to say, quote, to my mind, if you concentrate on an idea, develop it, a metaphysical and spiritual communication will ultimately help in the creative process, close quote. I remember noting these words down in a diary from a wise man, only to keep coming back to them ever so often, be it work, be it art, be it life. Today, when I look at the set of seven works by Raza Saab on Gandhiji, it is clear that Raza Saab was a man who walked his talk. And we, at Akar Prakar, are proud to host this show today with the Raza Foundation. Akar Prakar too has striven to follow the wise words of Raza Saab and with its continuing vision to showcase significant contemporary Indian art in distinguished museums and venues across the world. Last year we executed four projects in France along with the ICCR and the Embassy of India in France under Namaste France. These projects were Jai Shri Chakravarti's Life Will Never Be the Same with the KNMA, Kiranagar Museum of Art, New Delhi, at the Asiatic Museum in Nice, France. Manish Pushkale, Painter of Light, at the Musée de Gethery, a show of master artist S.H. Raza and Manish Pushkale at the Baudouin Le Bois Gallery, Paris, and Devanjan Roy with the residency and show at Chateau de la Napoul, France. This year, besides showing art showings overseas in India, we showed Ganesh Pine's rare early works in Kolkata and Ganesh Haloi solo show of recent works. Akar Prakar this year will present Jai Shri Chakravarti at the Music Ive in Paris in collaboration with the Kiranagar Museum of Art. Ganesh Haloi will also be showcased in Athens and Castle. Our vision is to present a wide view of the contemporary art practices in India along with opening dialogues between countries through the language of art. I am grateful to His Excellency Mr. Ziegler, that Ambassador of France to India, for bringing the French presence and, presence and connection to today's opening by agreeing to inaugurate the show and launch the book Gandhi and Raza, published by Akar Prakar Raza Foundation and Mapin Publishing. Thank you, sir. Thank you to Raza Foundation and especially to Ashokji for their trust in us and doing such fabulous work in the field of arts and keeping the vision of Raza Saab alive through their many programs in the field of arts. We salute to you, sir, for that. Thank you to all the wonderful speakers, Krishanji, Yashodra Dalmia, Odayan Vajpayee, Sudhir Chandra, and Ranjit Hoskote, who gave their insights into Gandhiji and Raza Saab through the wonderful exchange today. 
Even though two of the authors are not present here with us today, I would like to extend my gratitude to Gopal Krishna Gandhi for his insightful essay on Gandhiji and his sense of aesthetics from the point of view as an insider and a rasik. I express my gratitude to Master Moshaya Sri Nandalal Boshu for the tribute to Gandhiji he wrote in the 1940s for the Vishwabharati journals, which was later translated and edited by K.G. Subramaniam. And we were given permission to publish this in our book. Of course, last but not the least, thank you Ashokji for your essay, which beautifully describes in words what Raza Saab expressed through images. Thank you to Alka Pandey for the visual art gallery, to Bena Sareen for the amazing book design on the set of works, and thank you for bearing with me and joining us in the celebration of the 95th birth anniversary of Raza. Thank you.